So we are in the last part of this series, uh, The Most Courageous Decision, and we're really glad you came here to join us. Uh, we, have, we have talked about a lot of stuff in this series. I'm not going to recap all of it now, uh, but this has been my biggest hope, is that throughout this series, that you have had a desire to take your conversations deeper, and, and that's just been the whole focus of, we said, you know what, our conversations, our lives, our connections, they sit up here. They're on the surface level. Most of the things that we talk about are shallow. Most of the things that we talk about with people who we have known for years are the exact same conversations that we could have with perfect strangers. And so we're mostly here, but we want to go down here. We want to talk about stuff that matters. We want connections that are deeper. And so we've just kind of been talking about how do, how do we get there? What do we do to get from here to here? And just my biggest hope is that, is that within you, you have a desire for those deeper connections and those deeper conversations. And, and last week, we, we switched it a little different, and we started talking about faith. And the importance of talking about faith. And, and the big line that we had at the end is we realized, you know what? For those of us who would consider ourselves Christians, who would say that we're followers of Christ, uh, we need to know that we are God's plan A. That if people are going to know his story, his message of what he's done, that there is no other way that information is going to get out unless if we are going to go tell people about that. Now, now with that, a whole lot could go wrong. Like, there are tons of things that could go incorrectly, and we kind of steered clear of that last week. And that's what I want to focus on this week, of, of if you're going to talk about faith, if you're going to talk about your life and share your story, then, then how do you do that right? Years ago, uh, my youth group, when I was back in youth group, I think I was in 7th or 8th grade at the time, we would always take trips. Every year we would take a ski retreat. And so we would go up to Michigan, and how it worked is we'd spend one day skiing, and it was mostly a spiritual retreat. The skiing wasn't the big part of it, but we'd have four or five different worship services as part of it, and we did small groups and things like that during this weekend. So, so this one time, I'm in seventh or eighth grade, we're up there, and the guy who was the speaker for our services was talking about the, it was a Christian word, he was talking about witnessing. And so for them, he was saying, witnessing means you need to go out and you need to tell people about Jesus, that this should just be the thing that you are constantly doing. No matter who it is, whether you know them or not, you should be telling them about Jesus. And so I'm, in, I'm young, I'm impressionable, and so he says all this, and I'm like excited about my faith, I'm fired up, and so I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to go out and I'm just going to tell people about Jesus. doesn't matter if I know him or not. And so we had this one day where we would go shopping, which was... I was in seventh grade. I didn't, I didn't even know what you did with that because I never went shopping. And so we go shopping, and we're walking through the different stores. And so I'm checking out at one of these stores. I think I bought, like, a Nerf gun or something like that. And so I'm checking out at one of these stores, and there's a teenage girl. She's, like, 17 or 18. And so then she's like, that'll be this amount. And so I go there and give her the money, and I kind of went, do you know Jesus? <laughs> was like such a terrible transition lead and everything like that but I didn't I didn't know better at the time so I was like do you know Jesus and she's like no I don't believe in Jesus and so I'm like okay this is he told me I'm supposed to tell her so I'm gonna tell her here we go and so I, I don't remember exactly what happened I got like two or three sentences in and she goes well one of the big reasons she interrupted me which I was like geez, that's rude. I was about to tell you about Jesus. And so uh, she interrupts me and she goes, well, one of the big reasons that I don't believe is because my coworker who insteps this very large man who's like 20, because he doesn't believe, but I was not to be intimidated. And so I just kind of looked at him and I was like, well, why don't you believe? And so he listed off like four or five different reasons. And so I like, I was ready to go because I, I kind of knew my stuff at that point in time. So I start answering his objections, and he looks at me, and he goes, well, have you read the Bible? I went, yeah, I read the Bible. And he goes, no, have you read the whole Bible? I'm like, no, <laughs> it's really boring. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say that, but it was like, at that moment, I was just like, well, well, no. And he goes, well, I have, and how could you tell me that I should believe in God when I've read the whole Bible, and I know the whole story, and you don't? And this was my fired up, like, speaker was, like, pumping me up, ready to go. And so my response was, I don't know. And I, and I left. Well, to be clear, I got my Nerf gun, got the change, and then left. But I walked out of there, like, I was so defeated because I was so pumped up. He's like, you need to tell people about Jesus. I was like, okay, so I'm going to do that. And I went in there, and I got about two sentences in. I got embarrassed because he had read the Bible, and he didn't believe in God, and I believed in God, and I hadn't read the Bible, and I walked out. 
And I remember just walking out just thinking, you know what, I, I really think I did more harm than good there. Like, I don't, think, I don't think anything that I said, as bold as I was, as courageous as I felt in that moment, I don't think anything that I said was actually helpful. And if I could be really clear, I wasn't helpful. And I think that's very important. That when we talk about this idea of talking about faith, having conversations about faith, sharing our faith, or if you like the Christian buzzwords more, witnessing, I think there's a really thin, fine line between helping people, leading them to Christ, and pushing them away from God. I think there's a very fine line between when we actually do this, are we actually showing people an accurate picture of who Jesus was, or are we just giving them more reasons to rebel against faith? And that's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at what is the difference between when we help people and when we hurt people. Because I really believe this. I believe that there is just a lot of violence that has been done to the name and to the image of Jesus by well-meaning people who just didn't know better. And so what they do is, is they think that God is calling them to get out there with their sandwich boards and their protest signs or to shout anyone down who doesn't believe exactly what they believe. And I, I just think that's ridiculous. And, and we can look at it on that end, but I think we also need to look at it on the one-on-one -on -one end. That I think there's a lot of people who one-on-one -on -one in conversations, when they're trying hard, and I'll give them, they have the best of intentions. I don't think anyone goes out to share their faith with going, you know what I'm going to do? I'm either going to lead this person to Christ or I'm going to ruin their faith. That's my goal. Like, no one has that ambition. We all have good intentions when we do stuff. But, but the way that we do it, it, it's not what we're doing. It's how we're doing it. The way that we do it, I believe, can either attract people to Jesus or can really turn them off. And so what's the difference there? And that's what I want to look at this morning. So if you have your Bible, we are going to be in John chapter 4. If you don't have your Bible, we're going to have the words up on the screen, but we're going to be in John chapter 4. And in the first week of this series, as we started talking about courage, we said that our example should be Jesus. And we looked to a passage out of Philippians chapter 2 that kind of said, you know what, we need to be willing to be vulnerable. And we started using some of these terms of vulnerability and shame and how Jesus made himself nothing. And we said that our, our model for having courage is Jesus. Now, if that's the case, then Jesus should also be our model in our conversations. If how Jesus lives is our example of how we're supposed to live, then how Jesus spoke to people should also be our example. And that's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at a conversation that Jesus has with someone about faith. And, and this is what I want to do, and this may throw you off a little bit. Um, normally, in messages and sermons, we really look at the content of the, of the, um, of the Bible passage. We really look at it to kind of pick it out and see what things we can learn. I'm not really worried about the content this morning. I want to show you what Jesus did in the conversation. Because there is so much content um, in these couple verses that honestly, if we were actually going to try to unpack it all, we would be here for hours. And so I just want to look at what does Jesus actually do in the conversation? What is he doing at the different points? Where is he leading the conversation? So maybe we can pick up on some of the things that he did. So here we go. We're going to jump into it. This is John chapter 4, starting in verse 4. And it says this. This is referring to Jesus. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now, quick background. We've talked about some of this before. Samaritans were considered kind of half-breeds. They were very much looked down upon by the Jewish people. And a Samaritan woman really didn't have any significance in society. In fact, it, it'll actually say later in the passage that women, Samaritan women, did not talk to Jewish men. Like, that was considered just, like, culturally unacceptable. And so Jesus comes to this spot, and he sits down. He's tired. He's had a long journey. A Samaritan woman comes up, and, and this is how he starts the conversation. 
Will you give me a drink? It doesn't get more surface level than that. Like, I, I think sometimes we think that Jesus always had these, like, incredibly deep, meaningful things going on. You know, sometimes Jesus was just thirsty. And, and I think that's important. That That's where he starts. He starts right up top. Hey, would you, would you give me a drink? Um, for me, it would have been like this. Um, I would like to buy this Nerf gun. Now, that may not be, you may not have those frequent conversations. Honestly, I hope you do, because Nerf guns are still awesome, no matter what age you are, and I want you to know that. But, I mean, it, it starts there. Hey, will you give me a drink? And then it moves on. It says, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, if you're a little confused, it's because Jesus went from, hey, I'm kind of thirsty, to what you're nourishing your body with won't actually fulfill you. What you need to fulfill you is me, which is something far deeper, which you'll never get thirsty from again. In a hurry. Like, isn't that an incredible transition? He's like, hey, would you give me a drink? Well, how are you going to get water? Like, if you knew who I was, you would ask for living water. <laughs> to which I would have just been like, what? <laughs> Are, so do you need a drink or not? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a little confused here. And, and it just amazes me how quickly Jesus goes from shallow to deep in a hurry. And it doesn't feel awkward. I, I, I mean, there's some confusing spots in there. And again, we don't have time to unpack the whole meaning of water and living water and all that stuff. But it goes from shallow to deep in a hurry. Uh, when I was researching some stuff for this whole series that we're doing, I, I stumbled across a really interesting article. And uh, there was this guy, and his backstory was he had been in a band for years. He'd been a bass player in a band, and he needed a spot. He was looking for something to do over the summer, and he wanted to do something with music. He wasn't a Christian. And so this is in the, uh, this is in the 70s when the whole, like, evangelism, knock on doors, go up to perfect strangers and tell them about Jesus, that was a very big thing, a big movement at that point in time. And so he found out that there was this job, there was this group that was looking for a bass player for church worship services for these camps over the summer. And so he signed up for it, and he got in, and uh, they didn't care that he was a Christian, and so he's kind of doing his thing. And then as part of the job, he found out that during the day he was supposed to go and witness to people. Now, this camp's on the beach, and so literally what they wanted him to do is they wanted him to go around on the beach as people are hanging out, getting their tan, for me, getting their burn and freckle on. So as they're doing that thing, they wanted him to go up to this, these various people and just start talking to them about God. Sound terrifying to any of you? And, and so this is what he does. He says he just starts going up to people, complete strangers, and just say, hey, how are you doing? You doing well? Okay. Where are you visiting from? Oh, that's great. Um, it, can I just ask you, what do you think about God? And he said, this is what I found. He said, it shocked me. Because I thought if I was in these people's spots, I would be extremely resistant to this. Because I found that almost every single person was excited to have this conversation with me. That I was a complete stranger, and we are talking about the most intimate, the most deeply held personal of subjects, and person after person that I came up to was, was engaging me, was asking questions, was sharing their thoughts, was sharing experiences. He talks about how one guy who he went up to, at the very beginning when he started talking to him, the guy seemed to want nothing to do with him, and he was kind of surprised because everyone else had been really willing to share. And so he said they talked for like 15 minutes, 
And then the guy just started pouring out his whole history in terms of religion, God, and his pursuits, and all these other things. And he said he finally had to break because it was time for him to go to lunch with some of his friends. And the guy asked him, he goes, well, will you be back this afternoon? Because I'd like to talk to you more. And so he said he went back that afternoon and talked to him the next day and the next day. And we, we see something like this in the passage where Jesus goes, could I have a drink? And then he says, I'm the living water that will make you never thirsty again. And we go, that seems rough. I, I would think she would, be back, she would be against that. But we have instances, we have stories of people here today that they are excited to talk about things on this level. Now what happens next I think is so important. It says this, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now this is what Jesus stumbles upon. This is this woman's hurdle to faith. This is the thing that is keeping her back. I believe that everyone has a hurdle to faith. Um, many of us, even when we come to faith, we, we still struggle with some things. We still have some thoughts or ideas or things in our past that are still stuck in there. And, and the hurdle could be so many different things. It, it could be maybe a belief that you don't quite understand. Or maybe something that you completely disagree with, whether it's something in science, something you've seen personally, and you go, how do you believe this? This is what I struggle with. The hurdle could be Maybe something that's happened in your past. Maybe some things that you've been a part of that you feel like aren't acceptable. That you feel like you've got to hide this. You've got to somehow keep this in the background. Because if people knew this is what had really gone on in your life, they would reject you for it. That's where this woman is right here. You need to go, well, yeah, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five. You're living with someone now who's not your husband. You could just, you could just almost feel the tension and maybe the embarrassment from that moment of, oh, you're right. Another possible hurdle that I've seen from a lot of people is there was an incident that happened that usually revolved around church. Maybe it was a church person was mean to them. Or maybe they visited church and they had a really bad experience. Or maybe they had trusted someone who was a Christian and then been completely let down by them and was really hurt in that moment. You see, we have these different hurdles in our life. We have these different things that are obstacles to faith. And this is what we're usually taught. When this comes up, you need to attack it. When someone doesn't believe something that's right, you need to tell them what's right immediately. If someone's struggling with this, you need to tell them how it is. And then here's just the really obvious thing that for some reason we don't get. We're shocked when we attack their hurdle that they become defensive. And it's like, oh my, oh my goodness. Well, I, I didn't mean it like that. Like, well, you, you just came after them. You're talking about the most intimate, serious, deep of subjects. And when you attack someone, then you're shocked that they then become defensive. And so what's Jesus do instead? Because he says, he goes, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And this is where the conversation goes next. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. You see that? That was a very nice, like, right term by her. You go, yeah, you're right, husband. And she goes, oh, yeah, could we talk about the mountain? <laughs> I'd rather talk about the mountain. That feels safer. And this is what we'd expect. No, 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 no. I, I see what you're doing. You're, you're dodging the question. L let's talk about your husband. No, he says this. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. You see what he did? Because it's, it's absolutely brilliant. He hits her hurdle, and she takes an abrupt right turn, and he goes, okay, you want to talk about that? We can talk about that. That's fine. He keeps this conversation here. He doesn't let it go back up here. He keeps the conversation here. But when he bumps into something that is so sensitive in her life, she doesn't even want to touch it. He doesn't go after it. He leaves space. He leaves it open for her so that they can continue the discussion. And I think that's so important because so many times when we have these conversations, even though they may be very few and far between, but when we have these conversations, much of what we can do, much of what we do, is ends up closing down, down the discussion instead of opening it up. Much of what we practically do in our conversations shuts people down and puts them on the defense instead of opening them up and putting them in a spot where they want to continue the discussion. So, so how does he do that? Well, I think he knows a couple things. I think one of the most important things that he knows is that everyone would rather talk than listen. Right? Uh, we, we weren't going to do it this morning because, um, personally, I despise country music. I don't know if that's you, but that's, that's just me. But Toby Keith had a fantastic song years ago that was titled, I Want to Talk About Me. It was just, I'm tired of talking about you. I want to talk about me. And we all feel that way, don't we? I mean, you know that when you've, talking, when you've spoken to someone and it's just gone on and on about them and you're just thinking, it's not that they're not interesting, it's that I would much rather talk about myself. And that's what Jesus understands. You know what? She would rather talk about herself. And so let's do that. Her ideas. I, I think one of the most clear spots that we can be vulnerable is in how we listen. Not just in how we speak, but in how we listen to the people around us. And we usually think that if someone says something that we disagree with at all, then we need to come after it. We need to correct them right away. And I don't see any spot in the Bible where it says that we need to be the Holy Spirit's aides. That if someone believes something wrong or someone isn't quite convicted enough on an issue, then that's our responsibility to step in there and to tell them exactly how it is. I don't see that in the Bible. I see that our job is to be a zealous advocate, to be excited about faith, and to let people know the difference that God has made in our lives. And so one of the biggest spots is we leave that space open, and we ask questions. We ask questions. You see, when, when you ask questions, what you're doing is you're seeking an invitation into that person's life. When you actually stop for a second, and you say, okay, I, I'm not going to tell this story about myself, or I'm not going to tell you how smart I am here and here. I want to learn a little bit more about you and where you're coming from. You're seeking an invitation into their life. I, I think this is why it's so important, if I could just give a side note, as parents, that we ask our kids lots of questions, no matter what age they are. And I know as they get into teenager age and even older, they act like they hate the questions. They act like they can't stand it, and it's a huge burden to them that they would have to answer three, maybe four questions when they get home from school or when they get back from their game, and they're like, oh, my goodness, I just, oh, this is so hard. I don't want to talk to you. I, I know that's the response. But the issue is that when you're asking someone questions, you're saying, I care enough about you to know what's going on in your life, to know what you're thinking, to know what you're feeling, to know what's really, to know what you care about. You see, when no one is asking kids questions, what they do is they act out, and they get loud, and they disobey, and they do all these other things, because inside themselves, they're too emotionally immature to really know what's happening. And that is they're seeking for someone to care. 
And in the same way that kids are like that, that they need people to ask questions, they need people to seek that invitation into their life, adults are the same way. If they feel like no one cares, if they feel like no one, no one just cares at all what's going on in their life, they either shrink back into the corner, they remove themselves from the situation, or they do something to get everyone's attention based upon their personality. And so honestly, here's what I think the most important thing we can do, and the most important thing that we can learn from Jesus' example in terms of how to open up those conversations, how to keep them from shutting down. And it's this, ask questions, then be quiet. Ask questions, then I want you to hear this clearly, then shut your mouth. I don't know how many times I have been a part of and observed conversations where someone will ask a question and the person starts to answer And you can tell the person who asked the question is now at this point in time only waiting for the chance to insert their own applications. And it's like, well, how did this go? Well, when I was younger, it happened like, oh, me too. You're never going to believe this time that happened like this. And it's like, do you really care? Because it just seems like you're waiting for your turn to speak. And others of us, when we ask questions, we just can't stand moments of silence. And I understand, I get that. I, I'm very much the same way. That it's like, if I'm in a conversation, and it's like, there's a three, four second lull, I, I'll just walk away, I'll just go do something else. Because I, I get very uncomfortable with those moments of silence. But when we're actually asking questions about stuff that really matters, you don't know what's going on in that other person's head. You don't know what they're really thinking about. It may be in that moment that you ask them a question, about something that they actually care about, that they're trying to gauge in that moment, does this person care enough about me that I can really answer this honestly? Like, I mean, do I trust them enough that I can actually share with them what's really going on in my life and what I'm really thinking? And then this is what we do. There's silence for two or three seconds, and then we either start talking because we get uncomfortable or we walk away. And so in that moment that they're trying to gauge, can I trust them enough or not, we give them every reason not to. And so we just need to get used to this. Seek those invitations into people's lives. Ask good questions. And then honestly, keep your mouth shut for a little bit. Remove from your life the need to talk about yourself. And this is what you're going to find, is that in that moment, that is where empathy happens. And empathy is this, is this strange, hard to describe thing, that there is no right script for it. It's, it's creating space. It's withholding judgment from someone. It's not attacking everything that they say. And it's communicating that incredibly important message, you're not alone. And I care. You are not alone. I want to know what's going on. Even if I can't relate to it, even if I have nothing to do with it, I want you to know that I care enough to seek that invitation into your life. And I'll listen. And when we're empathetic towards other people, that is where trust happens. That's where trust grows. And it starts small. And it grows over time. And you'll find that as that trust grows, your conversations naturally move from here to here. So, what is the most courageous decision? Well, on the one end, it's a hundred things. It's the willingness to be vulnerable. It's the willingness to overcome shame. It's the willingness to talk about stuff that actually matters. It's the willingness to take on the example of Jesus that he set in his life, that he didn't have conversations that were here. He had conversations that were here. It's all these different things. But I think the most important thing that the most courageous decision is, is it's the decision that I will not live my life with my conversations and my connections here 
but I'm going to pursue something deeper that really matters. It's the decision of, you know what? With my friends and my family and the people that I care about, I am tired of having the same conversations over and over and over again that I could have with complete strangers. Maybe we should talk about something that matters. Maybe I'm going to take that really, really bold step and tell you what's really going on in my life. And you know what? I'm going to make that really courageous decision that I'm going to ask you what's really going on with you. And then I'm going to be quiet. And I'll ask a few more questions. And I'm just going to listen. I think it's such a simple thing. And and it almost feels silly that we would spend four weeks talking about our conversations. But honestly, this is, this is what I found out. Um, church, in terms of what church is and the benefit of church, as much as I hope you, that you enjoy Sunday mornings and coming here and, and being a part of what we're doing, this is, this is not church at its best. Church at its best is when, you, is when you go out to eat with people or you have people over to your house and you don't want the meal to end. It, it's, when, it's when long after the food is finished and you just sit there. And you don't really have an agenda. You don't have anything that you need to work out or plan out. But you are just happy to be in the presence of these people and talk to them about stuff that you can't talk to other people about. I, I think that's what church is really about. And I want you to know this. I want that for you more than anything else. I want that for you more than anything else. I want that to be the norm with your friends and in your family. That that when you gather with your family at the dinner table or around TV trays or whatever that environment is, you know, you you don't need to feel like, you know what, I had this thing and this thing happen to me throughout my day, but these people don't care. Or or I'm really struggling with this, or this has been on my mind, but I'm not going to talk about that. And and I don't want you to feel like, you know what, I've got this burden that I've held on to, or I've got this thing that I'm really excited about. But no one's going to ask me what's going on in my life, because they don't really care. I want you to move from here to here. And when you do, your life will be so much better. I promise you that. It will be so much better. And it's a risk. It's scary. A lot of things could go wrong. I promise you that. A lot of things could go wrong. But when it goes right, it is always worth it. So, let me pray for you. Father, my prayer is very simple for us this morning. Help us to find the relationships that we're looking for. Help us to find the relationships in our families. God, I think so many of us, um, to, to put it simply, we gave up on our families years ago. That we're there, we're in the same room, or we're in the same house and things aren't going how we want it to, and we just, we don't care enough to make it better. And and so God, give us a desire with um, with our spouses, uh, with our kids, with our siblings, to have the relationships that we actually desire there. Help us to lead in that way. Lord, help us with our friends and, and those who we know, whether we've known them since the day we were born or we just met them yesterday. Help us to take the conversation deeper. Because like so many people, when we want to talk about deeper things, for some reason we assume that no one else does. And help us see that others do, that that they're looking for someone to seek an invitation into their life. And so Father, my prayer most of all is that you would help us lead in this area that we would be courageous, that we would be willing to tell our story 
with our whole heart and that we would be willing to ask questions and then be quiet. And God, I just pray that you give us the courage and grace to do so. Amen. Uh, yeah. Daniel, right? Yep. Okay, thought so. Uh, how you been? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. How about you? Fine. Cool. Um, you heard anything else cool on Fox News? Yeah. Uh, actually, it was like a couple days ago. I was watching it, and um, there was some kind of story about like a squirrel on jet skis. It was pretty awesome. Uh, I don't know exactly what they did. I think they like custom made some jet skis for the squirrel, and you know, it was being pulled behind a little boat. It's pretty cool. I think its name was Cody, the, the squirrel, not the jet skis. Wouldn't like the force of the jet ski is like rip the squirrel in half? I don't know, man. That's a good question. I guess it's like... And where is jet skis? Like yeah. His skis? Or were yeah. they made of, like, tongue depressors? I don't know. Like, I think they were made of, like, titanium or something. <laughs> I don't know. I was kind of, like, half paying attention. I was going back and forth between uh, that and Duck Dynasty. So, yeah. Solid. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you see the girl at first base who just caught that ground ball? That's my niece. Anna. Anna's her name. Um, third base is Carol. Okay, your daughter, right? Daughter. Okay, cool. So it's cool you come out here and see your daughter. Yeah, niece. 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 My, yeah, Sorry. my niece. No, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah, I've, I've just been trying to come to as many of her games as possible. There's been some family stuff going on recently so I've just tried to like you know be there for her and everything like that that's cool yeah um if you don't mind me asking what, what kind of family stuff well her dad Mark was in a pretty bad car accident uh, a few months ago so it's been been pretty rough is he okay it was uh it was fatal he, he was in the hospital for a few weeks, you know, just trying to hang on. And, um, you know, man, it just got to a point where he couldn't anymore. Um, so it's been, it's been pretty rough on all of us. And I think I, think I have had a harder time with it than, than Anna has. You know, like, she's, she's pretty resilient for her age. She's a, she's a trooper. But, you know, I can't imagine having to grow up without my dad. And so I don't want her to go through that. So I'm just trying to be there for her through, through all this. But she's doing pretty well with it. Um, I've had a hard time with it. And his wife has had a pretty hard time with it. But she's staying strong throughout the whole thing. It's amazing. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, I couldn't imagine Carol growing up without a father. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it, it would be devastating. Yeah, man. Yeah. Hey, uh... My wife just sent me a text. Uh, there's a cookout after the game. If you want to yeah. come over. Yeah, dude, that'd be great. I'll bring Anna. It'll be awesome. Yeah. Sweet. Good deal. We're sure glad you joined us today. When we're singing that song, I was thinking there might be some people here that want to know what it is to have those deeper conversations it is to speak what is true. We have our connectors here today. If you're interested in going deeper to some of those levels, we have some things that we'd like to have you get involved with with us. Please see them at the end of service here and we can get you uh, signed up for the classes to possibly go deeper in that. I want to remind you tonight that there's no student XP and that next week we're going to start our series God right for you. I think we've had some powerful conversations over the last three to four weeks. And now we're going to answer some of those other questions you might have, that we all have. Is God right for us? 
So the other thing that's really exciting, coming up next week is the first kid stuff of the season. If you know anything about kid stuff, you won't want to miss this one because it's revamped and it's even better than before. So in the words of all of us at Kid Stuff, if you've ever been to a Kid Stuff, remember the words that we leave with. See you next week at... That's right. See, you guys got to come. Next week, you'll be able to learn that. So in this case, I'll say, see you next week at Crosspoint. All right, you're dismissed. Thanks for coming today.